Good morning, everyone, and welcome to EAB University, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Osborne from Michigan State University, and along with my EAB University colleagues, Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University Extension, we hope you will be enlightened with today's webinar, which is Forest Pests, Question and Answer, presented by Cliff Sadoff, who, as many of you know, is an entomologist at Purdue University and specializes in wood pests. If you registered this morning for this webinar and you had a question for Dr. Sadoff, could you please retype it in the Q&A or chat pod uh, now or during sometime during the webinar as some of our morning registrants, um, their information didn't show up just before I started this webinar. Um, and we will get to those questions as well as some others that most of you have already um, asked Dr. Sadoff. I will be sending out a survey tomorrow morning that has a survey, or yeah, a survey tomorrow morning that has information on how to acquire CEUs for partic participating in this live webinar. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available to, later for viewing on www.emerald-4.info. And with that, Cliff, um, you can unmute your microphone and we can right. begin the webinar. Great, thank you very much, Robin. It's, uh, it's good to be here and uh, it, it's nice to know that we've been uh, uh, on the forefront of this uh, webinaring for a long period of time. So we've been, we've been doing this webinar for, for a while so that uh, I think uh, this, this COVID uh, working from home transition has been a little bit, a little bit easier. So I'm hoping that uh, I have a chance to answer a lot of the questions that, that, that you all gave me. So in preparation for this, what I decided to do was I thought I'd start by, uh, I went through all the uh, questions that I'd received up to about eight o'clock last night and I put together a presentation that would address most of them. So I'm not gonna say uh, people's names and address their questions. So I'm just gonna leave that to the chat box. You can sort of re-ask questions if I didn't ask them, answer them sufficiently. So, but what I thought I would do is that a lot of, is I'd start off by uh, talking about uh, uh, emerald ash borer, uh, uh, because there were a lot of questions about that. And, uh, one of the simple, one of the main questions we we were asked was, um, how can you possibly uh, continue to, um, uh, how can you continue to manage emerald ash borer uh, in a time when you're not allowed to be on people's properties? You know, because there there are uh, uh, been a lot of problems uh, with with well, actually a lot of states have had this uh, stay at home work order. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about COVID and why we're doing all this social distancing stuff. And, you know, we often think that we are using the latest technologies to solve problems, but given that we don't know much about COVID other than that we know it's very contagious, uh, we know that uh, it, will, it will help us all if we can flatten the curve by using this practice of social distancing, staying six feet away from each other, uh, minimizing your, your your contacts with people using uh, face masks and and the like. Uh, this all came from uh, experience about a hundred years ago uh, with the Spanish flu, uh, and uh, there was a uh, it, it actually had two waves. One wave was in the spring of two thousand uh, of of nineteen eighteen, and another wave was in the fall. And uh, St. Louis was very, very careful with their social distancing. And, and you can see that the number of deaths that they reported, uh, that dotted line is a lot smaller than what happened in Philadelphia, where they insisted on having a parade uh, in September, which caused uh, a huge spurt in, uh, in uh, death, in, in deaths. So um, this is really uh, important. I, I got this. A particular uh, graph from the Purdue Landscape Report. Jana Beckerman wrote a, 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 an article uh, about uh, uh, the epidem epidemiology of this stuff. So uh, we have got uh, this this uh, landscape report, which is a newsletter we put out in Purdue, and we just put in our interpretations of the guidelines for the stay-at-home orders from our governor. 
and we try to talk, give people ideas on, on, on what they can and, and, and can't do. So if you are interested in reading it, uh, the link is up over here, or you can Google Purdue Landscape Report. Uh, it's the latest issue, uh, the March 31st issue, and you can get information on the COVID-19 guidelines from us. So I'm going to sort of encapsulate uh, what goes on. So when you have the, 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 the stay-at-home orders, the results of that are very different in different states. So uh, in Michigan and Ohio, no landscape work is allowed to be done. But uh, the landscape industry is considered essential workers under the clause that they, they are uh, due to because they are involved in, in construction. Uh, but they are also considered, uh, arborists are also considered uh, essential. Uh, based on safety needs. So uh, the International Society of Arboriculture put together uh, a, a white paper on this and uh, you know they, they reiterated the fact that trees which are dying uh, are going to fall down uh, whether or not they uh, whether or not we are in the middle of COVID. So if you've got trees that are in hazard situations where they're next to a, a property or they're going across a highway, they, they still have to be removed in order to protect the public safety. So because of that, that's considered an essential need. Uh, later on in the season, uh, you know, landscapers who are working to reduce health hazards, say, for example, if you're clearing brush this time of day, this time of year, uh, where in places where people walk in order to prevent them from getting ticks or in a few, in another couple of weeks, uh, when it starts raining, if you are mowing lawns to prevent refuges for mosquitoes, this is also uh, mitigates uh, the public health hazard. So that's some of what the rationale is behind this. Um, so <clears throat> let me move on to uh, ash trees. You know, ash trees uh, are dying from emerald ash borer. Uh, they're not stopping because of the COVID. And once they die, uh, they become very, very, brittle. Matter of fact, they're brittle like styrofoam. And last year we had Tim Walsh from Davy Tree give us a webinar at EAB University. You can uh, look at look this up uh, uh, in the uh, archive webinar because we have them available as YouTube videos. Uh, you look up Dead Ash Dangers uh, from Tim Walsh and uh, he talks about what you can do in order to, I mean, how you can remove ash trees in a safe manner. You know, one of the things that he talks about in his talk is that when, is that the, the ash limbs are so brittle that just using a chainsaw at the base of that could, could shake away one of the branches. And, you know, this is a picture I took in Indianapolis and you can see the broken branches. Uh, I wonder if I can get a pointer here. You can see this broken branch over here. This typically, they tend to break, they're very sizable limbs, they break about 30 feet up. So, you know, when I go, and you can see another bunch of other broken branches along this limb over here. When I go out and evaluate these sites where I'm doing some insecticide work, uh, the tree behind it actually is still alive because it's been treated. Uh, I never go on a windy day. Uh, I often will see uh, branches that are about a, a foot and a half <laughs> into the ground. Uh, I, uh, so. These are, these are quite dangerous, and that's why they, they have to be removed. Okay, so emerald ash borer decline waits for no pandemic. So, you know, what does this do about, uh, you know, how do we handle the trees, like the one on the left, which is alive because we treated it with emerald benzoate, you know, how do you keep it alive so it doesn't turn into the tree on the right? So, uh, you know, uh, inspections, you know, you know, even can be delayed because you may not be able to get on the sites. Uh, critical treatments may also be, be, be delayed. So uh, let's, let me talk about what we know about how treatments work uh, by reviewing the life cycle <coughs> of the emerald ash borer. Let me drink water here. Okay, so uh, the emerald ash borer um, right now is in the, what we call the J stage pupa where you see the, uh, the J stage, it's sort of a pre-pupil stage. It's just underneath the bark and uh, they're getting ready to pupate. Uh, they'll pupate in May and then they'll, <clears throat> they'll, they'll, they'll come out as adults in late May around the time when the black locust is in bloom. The adults will, will mate, uh, the females will feed on the leaves, uh, which is a great time for them to get exposed to insecticides. They will lay eggs, they'll hatch into larvae that bore beneath the bark and make the classic uh, galleries. 
So, as I, so the way the insecticides work is that when we infuse the trees with an insecticide by either pouring an insecticide at the base of the tree or injecting a tree, the material gets up into the leaves. It kills the adult beetles uh, when the females are feeding their mandatory maturation feeding for about two or three weeks uh, before they start laying eggs. That will kill the beetles uh, before they lay eggs. And then the material will also kill the beetles, the larvae when they're inside the tree. So uh, let me show you, uh, you know, this works really, really well, especially when you apply the insecticide in the spring. So the photo I showed you of those big scary dead ash trees were taken at Eagle Creek in Indianapolis, where we have trees, the trees, the average DBH is about 40 inches in diameter. So these are monster size, these are very old trees and very large. Uh, and we had assigned uh, the trees to three different treatments, either they received nothing, which is the control line, uh, or they were treated in the fall, which was in September, or they were treated in the spring. And what we found was that we were treated every, th that, that if we did nothing, of course, you know, the population, uh, the, the canopy thinning uh, jumped up pretty high in 2015, and by 2017, uh, all the trees were, were, were dead, okay, uh, that were not treated. Uh, interestingly, the, um, Trees that were treated in the fall with amectin benzoate, five mils of per inch diameter, uh, they got almost up to 40% canopy thinning. But then, the, as the dead branches started dropping down, the uh, you know the death stopped, but and, and they started to recover a little bit. But you know this level of injury, 40% canopy thinning, is really unacceptable in an urban area because you've got way too many um, <clears throat> dead limbs, and you also have got um, uh, uh, because when, when you're at that level of canopy thinning, there's a lot of structurally unsound parts of, of that tree. Uh, we had much better control uh, when we applied it in the spring. We had less than 20% canopy thinning. So you can see over here uh, that, the, that, that uh, spring treatments work, work really well. So, you know, so when I say the spring, I'm saying you want to you put this, these products in before the end of June, okay? We might get lucky. The COVID outbreak may peak, may pass uh, before then, but you know there's, there there are no guarantees. So what I'm what I'm saying from this slide is that if you're on a three-year cycle, okay, delaying till the spring, I mean till the fall, delaying till the fall will allow an additional accumulation of injury, uh, and the uh, trees uh, will have to. Will take some time to heal, and there'll be a lot, a lot more damage. So, um, one of the good things we know, this is some work by my colleague Deb McCulloch, uh, is that we know that uh, the emamectin benzoate kills larvae. So, what she did was she had uh, uh, eight replicates of forest-grown trees. Uh, she treated trees with um, uh, dinatefuran as a safari base, as, as a trunk spray. I made a culprit as imicide injection capsules, capsules, and then an injection with triage, uh, in, injection with the tree IV of emamectin benzoate. It started in 2008 and continued until 2014, where they felled the trees, and then they peeled them to count the number of larvae that were inside there. And what they found was that if they did nothing, uh, there were about 35, 36 larvae per square meter on, on each, each tree underneath the bark. Uh, if they uh, treated with dinatefuran once every three years, they had this, about the same amount of larvae. The dinatefuran just didn't work. But if they treated them annually using a bark spray, uh, they found a very low numbers of larvae. This is very good levels of control. Amidacloprid, uh, when it was treated once every three years or once every year, there were still there were a lot more larvae. Uh, it's just not as toxic to the larvae as, say, the dinatefuran. But when they used a low rate of emamectin benzoate or a high rate of emamectin benzoate, they had virtually no larvae, whether they treated it annually or once every three years. So, um, the, so, so the take-home point for this is that uh, it, it, if you are going to, uh, if you are, are treating your trees, well, okay, 
So the, the take home point is, is that if you are on a two year treatment schedule of emamectin benzoate, okay, and you can't get out there in the spring to treat, you can delay the application to the fall, uh, it, or because they will kill all the larvae because uh, they're going to have a, you may, if you treat in September, there will st still be somewhere in the order of about maybe 20% of your emerald ash borer will still be in the larval stage. Uh, you'll kill those and then you'll kill the following uh, borers the following spring because the stuff lasts for, uh, uh, for you know, you can, it, it lasts, you do have appreciable amounts of product in there the following year. Or you can just delay the applications to the following spring because, it, you know, what I showed you in, in my initial graph over here, my initial graph shows you this is the result of treating once every three years. So when we're treating these monster trees once every three years, we, uh, you know, you, you're still going to get great control. So what I'm saying here is that if you're going to go once, if you want to, once every two year schedule, you may want to skip this year and treat next, next spring. Okay. But uh, if you're on a three year schedule uh, and this is the year to treat, you're going to want to treat in there as soon as possible. Now, I know we say treat in the spring rather than the fall, uh, but you know, the longer you wait, the more of those larvae that are going to become uh, pre pupae, uh, the more the larvae that, that may actually pupate uh, and not feed. So, you want to treat them as, as, as soon as possible. So, if you're going to uh, treat those, those trees, you want to make sure that you irrigate. Uh, prior to treatment because during drought you're just simply not going to get that that kind of uptake. So when I say irrigate you want to make sure that you get some adequate soil moisture so there's good translocation. You'll know if uh, you don't have enough uh, translocation because it'll take a really long time to get uptake up in, 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 into those trees. Um, uh, so this is the same thing whether you're on a three-year schedule or you get a random homeowner's you know, noticing there's a problem with their trees, and they say, "Listen, can you can you treat them?" And you go in there and you realize uh, that the trees can be saved. You know, then you just go and treat as soon as possible. Just make sure you irrigate. Okay, uh, I did receive a question about uh, where emerald ash borer is now. This is based on April first data, uh, and pretty much uh, it's in most of eastern North America. Okay, with the exception of Mississippi and Florida. Uh, and uh, it's spread to isolated areas in Colorado. Uh, it's in the eastern part of Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, Oklahoma, and mostly Texas for that too as well. So, um, you know, this is where it is, it is right now. All right. Um, I received uh, a number of questions um, also about... Um, uh, about gypsy moths. And uh, this is a photo uh, taken by uh, Elizabeth Barnes up in uh, South Bend area. I was in, in the, in the uh, I think it was the Goshen area uh, two years ago. Uh, these are uh, trees that have been uh, defoliated by, by the gypsy moth. They were oak trees. And, uh, you know, basically uh, the gypsy moths, you know, they, they do their damage in, in, in April uh, and May, and then they, they pupate in June. They become adults in August, which lay eggs. And right now they are, they are in the egg stage. So what can you, so somebody want to know where it was and what you can do right now. Uh, I would definitely contact your state department of agriculture. I know they keep records on where the emerald ash, excuse me, where gypsy moths are. The Indiana DNR for certain does this. Uh, and if you're looking for egg masses, you know, this is, these are the, this is what you see uh, on the trunk. Uh, you see on the left-hand side. So if you see these things on trees, you could scrape them off. That can be helpful. Um, but, you know, uh, but in Indiana and in lots of places where uh, the gypsy moth is not considered established, uh, the DNR does a lot, <clears throat> a lot of the uh, eradication efforts on their own. Um, we do know that, um, Using uh, bark scraping uh, uh, can help scraping the egg masses can help. Uh, also, you can apply um, emamectin benzoate, a single injection can also help. One of the things we can hope for, uh, I know that last, last spring we were poised to have a really big outbreak of gypsy moth uh, in uh, the lower part of the mid Midwest and a lot of Eastern North America. 
uh, because the year bef the two years before we had rather relatively dry springs, and uh, that uh, last the spring of 2019 was wet and cold, which is perfect conditions for the for this fungus Entomophaga myomiga to come along and knock things back, and that's exactly what it did. Uh, the, uh, the the fungus and then the virus in the population uh, greatly reduced uh, the outbreaks in much of eastern North America. So uh, if we have another uh, wet spring, I would expect we shouldn't have too much in the way of gypsy moth outbreaks. Also, if it's going to be relatively dry, the gypsy moths that are around may in fact do pretty well, but because the numbers were relatively low, uh, I think the uh, capacity for destruction should be relatively low as well. Okay. Uh, the next question I had was about spotted lanternfly. Um, there was some uh, questions about growing degree days. Uh, uh, so uh, Elizabeth Barnes, uh, who was one of our co-hosts and helps here, uh, uh, one of the people who helped put on this program, uh, she uh, has, got, has been going to Penn State to get uh, the latest information for some people about uh, from the experts about uh, the spotted lanternfly, and what we're we're finding is that there is a emerging a, a set of activities that can be done. Uh, this comes from a pamphlet that was produced by Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. Uh, we're not necessarily trying to plug their products, but they got a great graphic over here, which we like to use, and. Uh, you know, right now they are wintering in the egg mass stage, in, in, in the egg stages. Uh, they, and the, the egg stages are very uh, hard to see because they look like mud on, on bark, but you can scrape that stuff off. Uh, and then uh, come May, you can put sticky band traps and then you can scrape the eggs again after the adults stop laying eggs again. Um, we can remove tree of heaven uh, at any time during the year. Uh, there are foliar sprays, uh, foliar cover sprays can be effective uh, in May once the eggs start to hatch. I do not know what, grow, what growing degree days are out there. Uh, we, 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 we couldn't find that information, but uh, the nymphs are pretty remarkably easy to identify. They're black with white spots. Uh, and then they just they just get they just get a little bit bigger as as time goes on. And then they just before they become adults, they are uh, red with white and black spots, and then they become the distinctive uh, adults. So uh, we don't have any information right now about growing degree days, but we do have a calendar of activity that could guide what you could use. You could use foliar cover sprays, uh, trunk and limb sprays. Uh, you know when, when the nymphs are out. Uh, there is something called a Transtech bark spray, which is actually the active ingredient is dinotefuran. It worked very much like uh, the emerald ash borer uh, uh, bark spray. As a matter of fact, I think it is the same spray. Uh, the material is translocated through the bark, uh, and then it goes up into the into the foliage. But because this product is so mobile, it will kill these uh, spotted lanternflies as they are feeding on the sap on the, in, in the trunk. Okay. Uh, other questions uh, we had uh, was about general status of the longhorn beetle. Uh, APHIS has got a great website over here. Um, we've got, uh, and I'm going to hopefully, I'm going to open this up. Here we go. Perfect. And uh, what we see here is uh, so if you Google US Department, USDA APHIS, two words. USDA Department of Agricultural Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Uh, and with the word Asian longhorn beetle, this will come up. And uh, they have lots of information about what's going on with the status. And uh, one of the things uh, that, that happened, they have a nice information here about, about the latest news. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, not, it's not funny, but actually, uh, you know, in uh, October of 2019, uh, they declared uh, Asian New York City free of Asian longhorn beetle only, uh, and, and they also found this as well. Uh, uh, but 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 they also uh, that was only to be followed by uh, finding uh, uh, that uh, 
a new find in December in, I'll go back over here. Oh shoot, hello? Am I still here? Yep, you're still here. Okay. <laughs> uh, what do you see in front of you now? The Asian longhorn beetle status. Okay. Uh, Are you going hmm. to your other machine? No, yeah. Oh, oh, okay, good. I found it. Okay, good. <laughs> no, what happened was my, 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 my browser took over my screen. Okay. So what happened was that up until last year, uh, you know, they, they declared success. And I think there's a lesson here, never declare success with, when you talk about invasive species because uh, uh, you, you'll, uh, these invasive species are, are a little more persistent than we like to see. So you see uh, on the right-hand side of the screen over here, you see red, red dots. Okay, so, uh, you know, even though it was declared eradicated in uh, 2014 from Boston, uh, you know, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was still continued to be detected. It was detected again in March of 2019 in Worcester. Uh, even though it was de declared, uh, New York was declared free of, of uh, Asian longhorn beetle, it was found again in December of 2019. Uh, and, uh, the, the, it was they declared uh, an eradication in um, Ohio in the Cleveland area, but it was found again in December of 2019. Now, this does not mean that these programs are a failure. Far from it. Okay, when these areas like Chicago, they still haven't found it in Chicago yet, it's, and that that's been st stable for a long time. When when the Asian longhorn beetle is found. Okay, there is a, a massive program to find it, uh, 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 detect it, re re remove the uh, infested trees, uh, remove all the infestations they, they can find. And uh, even though we kill a lot of trees, maybe something in the neighborhood of the thousands of trees, uh, we're not, it's nowhere near the hundreds of thousands or millions of trees that are actually being threatened. So that even though um, APHIS, you know, Errat you know, removes you know, tens of thousands of trees, they're still sa saving millions and millions of trees because they're just uh, isolating the infestation to this area. Uh, so they find it, in, they said it was gone from New York City and then they found it again. Uh, when, when they say that, 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 that it's been eradicated, it means it's, it's, the population is so low that nobody can find it. There still are, uh, it's possible, there's always possible that there are uh, uh, beetles that are still lurking about that just that just can't be found. But because people are continually looking for it, that's why these citizen science programs are so important. Because people are continually looking for this thing, they can still find uh, they can still find it. And now, instead of it being throughout that entire New York City metropolitan area, metropolitan area, it's just in an area in Central Long Island. Okay, so uh, you know this is actually uh, uh, so. It, so you can expect these things to pop up from time to time. But you know, when I look at Chicago, it hasn't been seen since 2008. That's 12 years. So if it hasn't been there for 12 years, I'm gonna think that's pretty good evidence that it really is gone from there. So, uh, you know, uh, I still think that they should keep their eyes open in Chicago because you, know, you never know when it pops up again. But for the most part, um, you know, it's when, when it's gone, uh, you know, you'd still be out there, but, but this work is, it, that APHIS has been doing has been really very helpful in, in, in reducing the spread of these sorts of things. Um, so one of the things that we're gonna be doing in about uh, uh, three, two or three weeks, uh, we're going to be, uh, 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 Elizabeth Barnes, uh, Carrie Tauscher and I uh, are, are, have been running a uh, forest pest outreach, uh, Forest Pest uh, uh, Volunteer Reporting a, a Program, where we've been training volunteers in Indiana. And what we're gonna do this year uh, because of this COVID is that we're gonna be putting on this training virtually. So you're welcome to uh, go on to show how we teach people to recognize some of the common pests like uh, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, thousand cankers, uh, and uh, later on spotted lanternfly, hemlock, wool, adelgid, and gypsy moth. And then we, we teach them how to look for them 
and then uh, how to go about reporting them. And uh, you know, we urge you to uh, use this information in, 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 in your, your own region. Okay, other questions people had. Uh, you know, John Womancy from uh, Indiana had a question about uh, what is the status of invasives in Indiana? That's a really big question, John. Uh, and we have a website called reportinvasive.com, which uh, allows us to uh, uh, keep track of what the invasive status is. Okay, uh, so right now, uh, Asian longhorn beetle is not in Indiana. Um, and, but, uh, and neither is spotted lanternfly, but that could change in a blink of an eye. Um, so uh, I just say go to that site for, for, for more information. Um, I had another question about biological control and invasives. Um, you know, what's being done to get rid of this for, for forest pests? Well, for biological control, I just want to sort of discuss about what that really is. Biological control is the use of predators, which could be ladybugs or, you know, ground beetles, uh, mice in the case of gypsy moth, uh, to kill the pests. Parasitoids are often uh, small microscopic wasps that uh, do not sting people, uh, that can attack emerald ash borer, can attack the eggs of, and the larvae of of gypsy moth and others. And then of course there are pathogens like Entomophaga mymiga, which is a fungus which kills uh, gypsy moths during, during cool seasons. Uh, classical biologic control is involves when, when regulatory agencies uh, in different parts of, of USDA will go to the country of origin. For example, when Emerald Ash Borer came, uh, there were teams of scientists that worked with their colleagues in China uh, to bring back uh, the parasites which were attacking the emerald ash borer in China. Once these things are, 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 are cleared as, as being safe for release in North America, they then become released in different sites. And that's if you, there's a, a site called Map Biocontrol. Map Biocontrol, you Google that and you can find out what releases have been done for various uh, pests in. Um, against emerald ash borer and the like in, in North America. So this is something that state agencies get involved with, but homeowners uh, could get involved in augmentative biocontrol by saying you're know, buying ladybugs or lace wings uh, or uh, predatory mites and releasing them. Uh, but for the most part, unless you have, uh, you know, say a greenhouse or the like, we generally try to get people just to conserve what they have, keep the good guys around. In other words, so if you have got um, say so if you have aphids on a uh, uh, if you have aphids on a a tree, let's say aphids on uh, an oak tree. Excuse me, aphids see, aphids on 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 an crab apple tree early in the season, and you want to let the uh, natural enemies control them. Generally, by holding back on the insecticides or using a selective insecticide like soap or oil, insecticide soap or horticultural oil, will kill the insect without killing a lot of the natural enemies. So, and that would be uh, allowing you to conserve the natural enemies that could come in and finish the job. I had another uh, question about chestnut oak blight. Uh, you know, there, uh, there is a, a, we don't, I, I spoke with uh, Tom Creswell, Creswell from the, uh, India are a Purdue plant pest diagnostic lab. And uh, we, he said it was suspected to have a chestnut blight, oak blight on some chestnut oaks, but uh, it was just really too early to tell whether or not that was actually caused by the blight or something else. So uh, the take home message is that if you start seeing dying trees and they're dying in mass for a reason, definitely contact your uh, state uh, Department of Agriculture in Indiana, we call we say 1-888-NO-EXOTIC. You know, you call that number or you use uh, the Report Invasives website and you can report it on, uh, on the app, uh, the Gleddens app, which we have uh, for reporting these things. Uh, this information, you know, you would just report this so that we could find out what is going on. Uh, I had another question about Phythophthora cinnamomai. Uh, uh, it was only found twice in Indiana, but it's fairly common in the southern part of the United States, and it has a very, very wide host range. Uh, Phytophthora 
uh, feed on, on, on a lot of trees. It's a, it, it is a uh, vascular rot, uh, and it, it will cause uh, the death of, of trees. So uh, if you start, so uh, I really can't say much in the details about which hosts uh, that are on there, but just know that it's widespread and that by reporting bunches and groups of dying trees to uh, state regulatory agencies or through whatever citizen science program that you have in here, that would be uh, uh, helpful. Now, we have a bunch of apps, uh, the Tree Doctor and the Shrub Doctor. And th these are available at something called PurduePlantDoctor.com. Uh, we just revised the Tree Doctor and we just revised the Shrub Doctor. Uh, and it is now free uh, for the uh, iPhone. Uh, we're gonna have the Android uh, uh, apps uh, being out there free soon. So uh, you can go onto the uh, app store uh, on your iPhone and you can, you can download it for free. And we have a lot of information about a lot of pests. Now what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to switch over to demonstrate the app and then uh, answer a couple of more questions about stuff. I want to show you how you can actually that you, you can actually report information uh, on this here as well. Uh, how am I doing with time? Oh, 48 minutes. Ooh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay. Um, so can we switch now? I'm going I'm to end my slideshow, and uh, I'm going to stop share, and I'm going to start sharing this other one. Okay. Three, two, one, and I'm going to open There you up. go. Good. Looks good. All right. Okay. Is, do you see an okay in there or not? No. I just okay. see your Purdue Tree Doctor screen. Okay, good. I'm just click that okay. Okay, great. Now, whew, that worked. <laughs> All right. So uh, the way this works is that we have uh, uh, 250, uh, uh, over 200 different disorders. They're grouped broken by insects, they're broken up by diseases, or if you want to, you, you just, you want to say, look for, say, something like gloomy scale. Somebody had a question about gloomy scale. Uh, you can type it up, and we have pictures of the gloom, of, of what the general injury might look like. This is uh, a little bit slow because it's being broadcast. Uh, you can get pictures of the, the gray color, gray covers on, on the trunk, and then uh, we have uh, detailed information about what, what, what the damage looks like and the different life stages. And you can see, you know, when you pop open the covers, you'd see the pink uh, uh, gloomy scale underneath. Uh, somebody asks, we have information to describe the damage, different life stages, and we have also have information about the control. So somebody asked me what is uh, going on with this. The gloomy scale is a southern species of scale uh, that tends to be uh, found uh, pretty much, I would say, Columbus, Indiana, and south. Okay, so it's not quite up into Indian, in Indianapolis yet, uh, but it's in the, and it's also in the, on, in the eastern seaboard, uh, up along the coast, uh, because it tends to be a little bit warmer winters than it does in the Midwest, it's also present there. Uh, Stephen Frank and uh, Adam Dale have been doing an awful lot of work on this, on this insect, uh, and they find that in cities, uh, where uh, trees are surrounded by more than 30% uh, hardscape, so they're sound, surrounded by pa these paved areas that don't allow water to move around. Uh, they tend to, uh, water to get in there, uh, they tend to have higher uh, abundance of, of, of scales. Um, I had another question about uh, bark beetles, and uh, so uh, there are one of the problem. One of the things we have uh, for uh, bark beetles, you know, what's the best way to deal with these things? Whether you're talking about a forested situation or you're talking about a landscape situation, you'll often see something like this, where you'll see a tree. Uh, the white pine on the left is dead. The one in the middle is dying, uh, and the one on the right is still alive. Uh, right, you know, sanitation is probably the best thing that you can do at this point in time for these sorts of things because the beetles uh, should not be flying. Although I guess the last, the warm weather the last couple of days may, may have changed that. But if you remove the dead, the dead trees or the half dead trees, uh, that will remove all the larvae inside before they can fly and attack the the healthy trees on the right. So getting rid of these things before the beetles fly is really good. Uh, after you've gotten rid of these trees 
treat the trees that are nearby with an insecticide uh, before uh, the, the weather warms in, in, in April uh, to kill the, the, the adults. Uh, so I think there's a flight period in the spring and there's a flight period in the fall that, that, that you can exploit. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was that uh, we've got um, uh, on this uh, Tree Doctor app, if I wanted to say, look at something for the, uh, if I wanted to report a, an incidence of spotted lanternfly, Oops, uh, spot a lanternfly. I could uh, I could push this button that says uh, report. So if I saw if I saw these uh, muddy egg masses, or I saw you know, uh, the uh, the flies, I could push this report button, and it will uh, leave the app, and it will allow me to take a picture. Uh, and 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 re report where uh, what has been found. So um, these are some of the things that we, that we can do with, with these apps, and they're, they're, they'll be useful for these. Um, they'll be quite useful for this. Um, uh, any kind of uh, citizen science reporting. So with that, I think I'll open up the floor for some questions. Okay. Um... Okay. Mel Kennedy has one. I attended a forest invasive species event and they talked briefly about a red banded boar on fruit trees. And he says the name may not be correct. Is there any updates on this? Uh, yeah, uh, okay. So yeah, there, there are a number of exotic boars that, 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 that are involved. Let's see, that, that are involved over there. I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna, should I stop this broadcast or should I, what should I do here? I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm going to just, uh, sorry. Did you want to get back to your other screen? Is that what you're looking uh, to do? No, I'm going to, I'm going to get back to, uh, I'm going to just cancel. Uh, I'm going to get back to my app because I can use that for, for questions. So there is a, there are a number of, of programs out. So the, the program is called the Forest Pest Outreach Survey Project. Okay. And it's going on in a number of states uh, in, in, in our region. Uh, I think throughout the uh, Eastern North America. And um, there's the uh, red banded leaf roller, I believe is one of the exotic pests that, 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 they're, that they're looking for. And I do believe that, that is act, they have a, a pheromone trap that, that, that is involved for that one over there. So uh, I'm not sure about the details about that. I know that uh, I'm going to take a, if I can look under, uh, there's a look, it's the red band of leaf roll. I'm going to look it up on my other machine right now and see what happens. Uh, what do you see? Do you see? Do you see a new screen on there now or not? It just says search all causal Asians. Perfect. Okay, good. So you're not seeing me type. Okay. Correct. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to say uh, Saris Pest Tracker. Okay. And Mel says you're right. That is what what the bug was. The bug. Okay, good. I, yeah, it's a good thing I started on tree fruit, and I have a, a memory like a steel sieve. <laughs> okay, uh, so there is something called Pest Tracker, and uh, I'm going to stop sharing this screen. And I'm going to switch this. I'm going to stop sharing this. Well, actually, no, and, and actually, uh, actually, what I'll do, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on this screen over here. And I'm going to open up this website and I'm going to call it uh, Pest Cirrus, C E R I S, Pest Tracker. And it's put out by CAPS. Um, and I'm going to just open it up like this and see. And uh, it should open up. And okay, that's I should stay up like this. And and what you're going to see is that this th this is actually meant does better in in widescreen, but it, it tells you information about different kinds of pests. So when I put when I click the button pest and maps, uh, I can look up different bugs. So this was the red banded leaf roller. I wonder if I just can scroll scroll down. 
um, let's just say red, 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 red. Well, it's not on there. But if I wanted to do say something like spotted lanternfly, which I can open this up and I can open the maps and you can get a, a view of the map of where it is. And they try to keep this updated. So there, there, there's a, a, a group called CAPS, the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey that uh, tracks a lot of this information. And this is a really good way to stay up to date. So uh, at the end of each year, every single uh, CAPS coordinator makes sure that all the information is loaded and that, and, and, and that, and that one is there as, as well. Uh, there are other ones, uh, the folks in Georgia, uh, Bugwood, uh, uh, the Bugwood, Bugwood group also has uh, uh, some maps that are available there as well. Next question. Um, if uh, right right now I'm not seeing any more. Um, if you have questions, if you could please them, please type them into the chat pod or into the Q and A pod, and uh, Cliff can answer them. Um, if I don't see any more questions here in a little couple minutes, because sometimes it takes a minute for people to type them out and do it, then I will. Um, you can always ask. I'm going to put. Cliff's contact info on the email that you will be receiving tomorrow, and you could ask them of him at that time too. Okay, hold on here. Suzanne Wainwright, has there been any studies on oils and spotted lanternfly eggs, differences and differences between the oils? You know, uh, Susan, I, 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 Suzanne, I don't really know. Uh, if, if, if they've done it. Uh, I do know that um, there was this uh, called Golden, Golden Natural Spray Oil, which was a, a, a soybean product that they would use to kill gypsy moth egg masses, which, uh, you know, when I think of a gypsy moth egg mass, I can't imagine something any more hydrophobic than that. Okay, you know, something that's uh, you know, because with, with all those the, those those scales, and, I mean, all the scales and the and the moth hairs on there, it'd be pretty hard to get the water through them. So I think the oil, the oil could penetrate that. I do not know uh, what the egg masses of um, of spotted lantern flies are made of. I know it looks like mud, but I'm going to guess because they are uh, uh, hemipterans, because uh, and uh, that that group of of, of insects uh, tend to produce an awful lot in the way of wax. I'm gonna assume that there's probably a pretty big waxy component uh, in that egg mass and oil will dissolve wax. So, you know, if we can get oil through the cover of an armored scale, I think the oil could probably work pretty well. So I would guess, you know, uh, so I don't, not aware of any data, but I would not be surprised if the golden natural spray oil or if some of the, uh, oils applied at the dormant rate could could actually work. Okay, the Elizabeth is Elizabeth is also uh, chiming in on this. Um, she says, yes, but there are issues reaching all the eggs because they will lay their eggs high in the trees. So you will kill some eggs, but might miss others high up. Okay. So, but, but, but they will kill, they will kill the eggs they touch. Is that right, Elizabeth? We'll wait here for a second. I do have, yes, based on early studies, she says. Great. Thanks, yeah. Elizabeth. Um, uh, we have a comment here, Japanese scale information. I came across this pest this winter in St. Louis and believe it came on nursery stock. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, Japanese maple scale. I'm gonna open it up right now and uh, tell you a little bit about it. It is a real, well, I, uh, well I'm a scale guy okay. <laughs> by, by nature. So uh, this is what the scale looks like. And um, I think I can do that. Yeah, this is what, what the scale looks like. And uh, they are, you know, like I, I was mentioning before how the uh, uh, spot of lanternfly uh, is actually in the same order of insects 
as scale insects. Okay, and it you know it it, it was imported. I guess I guess it was imported from Japan, given the name. But it's been in in North America for uh, a long period of time. Uh, it's very difficult to control because uh, it's this part of this group of armored scales that have what we call a pupillarial stage, which means that beneath the waxy cover, there is actually a pupa, uh, a, a skin that actually protects the, the scale even more. So it's very difficult to get the oil to go through the waxy cover as well as the pupillaria as, as well. So, um, but uh, we do know that oil in the dormant season can be somewhat helpful. Uh, but the problem with this guy is that they don't winter all in the same stages. Some winter as eggs, some winter as nymphs, some winter as the like. So I'm going to go back to the pesty tail and I'll just describe the life stages. Well, uh, they um, we're not seeing that on our screen. I not, I'm not sure which um, device you're um, using. I'm starting to broadcast. Okay. How about now? Can you see? There you go. Better. Okay. And we'll try it now. And okay. How about now? Okay. So here we go. So this is what, what it looks like. Okay. You see yep. uh, the uh, scale insect on the, uh, which are these gray, uh, uh, looks like little oysters, <laughs> skinny little oysters. And then some, when, when you rub them, uh, you rub the white wax off, they turn brown. You can see in the lower left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a scale that's been parasitized with a hole chewing, chewing around it. Uh, I go into the information where I just look at the, the, the icon on control. It says it winters as it says, I wrote this, <laughs> but it winters as mated and immature females uh, and the eggs will hatch into wingless scales called, stages called crawlers. Because they're in the pupillarial stage, they, the, the, that crawler period lasts uh, about four to six weeks. And uh, so it's, it, you, you probably will have to spray them twice with a, a compound called a pyroproxifen. Um, uh, or which which works pretty well, or you can uh, use uh, it's the last compound on listed here, uh, or you can use a, a horticultural oil as well. Uh, you always want to make sure that the scales are alive by flipping them and uh, uh, look for bodies filled with the pale purple fluid. In this case, uh, I usually tell you the the color of what what it is uh, in each one of these entries uh, as as I know it. So, um, yeah. All right, are there other questions? questions? Is there oh. anything else, Cliff, that comes to mind that you wanted to talk about or are we kind of ending the ending our today's discussion. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, if I want to get back to the original discussion about uh, talking about uh, COVID um, and invasive species, you know, uh, it's interesting, you know, I'm actually in the process of writing an article where I'm talking about flattening the curve of maintenance needs for emerald ash borer by using an area-wide based approach. And, you know, uh, these are invasive species that we're talking about, uh, and they're going to continue to invade, you know, during pandemics. Uh, so uh, what we need to think about is, you know, of course, always, you know, people come first, we want to, you know, stay safe. But, you know, if, like in the example that I gave you about the emerald ash borer, you know, knowing how our treatments are actually working, uh, can give us a little bit more latitude than we than we think we have. Of course, it's always best to do your monitoring and do implement your management activities at the right time of the season. But if you can't, you know, if you know what the biology of this organism that you're working with and how the the management activity actually works to reduce the problems with that pest, uh, you could you might be able to get some benefit by delaying your activities until uh, at an important time. Until, until, until a, a safe time can occur. And then the final thing is that, you know, uh, dead ash trees and, uh, are, are very dangerous. And 
if you see an ash tree that that's half dead uh, or you know a maple tree or or whatever due to some sort of invasive species um, you should still have that tree removed because that is considered a critical need because you're protecting human health so that's all i have all right um, I don't see any more questions, uh, so I think that we will end our discussion for today. And folks, this webinar is being recorded and will be on the www.emerald-bore.info website on the EAB University page here in the next couple days for sure. So thanks everyone for attending and thank thanks, you Emma. very much Cliff, for all your um, information, and this has been a great question and answer. And also, thanks, Elizabeth, for getting all those answers and questions and everything together as well. Um, we'll yep. talk to everyone, yep. probably, hopefully, we will see you, what, in a couple of weeks. So, yep. couple thank of weeks. you all. Okay. Yep. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.